Okay, so we're finishing up uh, the second half of chapter two, uh, which is about social responsibility in this case and how all that start, how that started. Um, social responsibility really is not necessarily a new concept. It's just changed over the years. You know what? Uh, because businesses gain their uh, wealth and notoriety from society, right? It's society who decides to purchase their products or to visit their restaurants or, you know, hair salons or whatnot and make them wealthy. Um, do they not owe society anything back? You know, are they just sort of that separate part of society that they just do business with us and that's it? Or do they not owe anything back to society? So social responsibility looks at, you know, do business activities have an impact <clears throat> on society and should businesses consider that impact when they make decisions? That led to a discussion on what is very good corporate citizenship, you know? Um, do they not have, uh, our business is not citizens of their uh, of our communities, of our states, of our of our country, and and do they have anything uh, to fulfill as citizens? So these are the the interesting things. I think that social responsibility um, makes it um, makes it for an interesting conversation. I'm going to go back to the slide for a second because you know business activities do have an impact on society. Uh, and business decisions do have an impact on society. And even though there's a list of businesses that are given here in terms of the uh, corporate responsibilities, top 10, you know, best corporate citizens, um, it might not necessarily explain the idea of, uh, of social responsibility, you know, the way I'd like you to, to understand it. And I think what I wanted to do is there's several examples in the book I'll mention, uh, but I want to focus on on one particular company that uh, I'm a little bit more familiar with. So your book mentions here that Target stores um, they donate uh, you know school supplies, books, field trips to local uh, schools in need, and so there that's how they're showing their social responsibility. Um, that they have, uh, it's a business activity that has an impact on society and they've decided to sort of give back. Um, your book also mentions that Procter & Gamble, which makes Tide, you know, if, you, if you've washed your clothes, you've probably seen the Tide pods and other types of things around. Um, well, they actually have a whole bunch of trucks that go to disaster areas um, so folks that have been hit with hurricanes or other types of problems, so they can wash their clothes for them. Because um, they feel that's a, that's a nice way to give back to society. It's a good business activity. Uh, society has made them wealthy and because Tide Pods and other products are very popular. So they've decided to help society back out in that way. Uh, your book also has a uh, example of a small uh, fast food hamburger chain in Texas called uh, P. Terry's. And every month, they, one day, I'm sorry, every quarter, every th one, one day out of a three month period, they donate 100% of their profits that day to a local charity. And so that's how they've decided to do social responsibility and, and be a good citizen to their society and to give back to society and have a positive impact on them. Um, I wanna talk about Ben and Jerry's. Uh, I don't know if you've had their ice cream before, um, but uh, as you, you probably have heard of Ben and Jerry's and Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Uh, ben and Jerry's took social responsibility to a new level. Uh, they decided when they, um, uh, when they made their particular ice cream, they were going to be using local dairies, small, uh, small farm uh, dairies. Um, yeah, they do have very good ice cream, Cameron, I agree. Um, they also decided that when they were going to add berries to their, um, some of their ice cream, 
they decided to use Indian reservations, Native American reservations that, uh, that had farms so they could support indigenous peoples. They also decided to, um, uh, in their, they have an ice cream where they have brownies, baked brownies that are pieces that are in, in their ice cream. Well, where did they get their brownies from? They, they could have got them anywhere, but they decided that they wanted to have a positive impact society. So they actually hired a, uh, a kitchen in White Plains, New York, that basically homeless people were working at. Uh, and supporting um, homeless people and the mission of that particular company by bake, having buying their baked brownies for their ice cream. So Ben and Jerry's has taken this idea of how a business activity impacts society at, to this whole new level. Um, they are a very unique company in that regard, and. Some companies uh, have uh, caught on and, and started to do these types of things and uh, supported things in society that, and even now we have a lot of uh, racial issues in our society. There are some companies that have taken a stand. Uh, they've pulled advertising from, from programs that have been uh, looked upon as supporting uh, racism in some way. And they have put money uh, into causes that uh, basically reflect their values and how they want to have a positive impact on society. Now, whether that's something a business should do or not has really been debated for a long time. You know, uh, if you go back in time and you look at the history of this, uh, the, the traditional view is businesses' responsibility to society is to make a profit so they can grow. They can employ more people um, and they can sell more stuff to society and fill those needs. Uh, this, that's the, that was the traditional view. Uh, since Ben and Jerry's, they've taken it to a whole new level, like I said, of, you know, deciding to buy, um, like I said, uh, berries from Native American tribes that grow certain berries to support indigenous peoples. Um, that's a whole new level of thinking when it comes to making a business decision. And that really is the basis of the question of social responsibility now. Uh, what type of business activities have an impact on society? So let me ask you, although the, this particular corporate citizenship thing is very nice, Microsoft, uh, j and et cetera, they all do very, very good things as corporate citizens. But let me ask you personally, if any of you work for a business that uh, gives back to society and fills that role of social responsibility. Does anyone have any examples of what your business uh, or a former employer or your current employer might do to help society out? When I worked for um, ShopRite, they would do lots of uh, local food fundraisers and stuff like that and donating groceries. Excellent. That's a very good example, Ross. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, you know, sharing the, I mean, they're, they're a grocery store. They, they got plenty of food. So, and they understand that there's uh, food insecurity. Hunger is real. There's a lot of people that only eat one meal a day uh, in certain uh parts of society and that's it's a sad reality because we have tons of food in this country so why waste it and so that's uh some some businesses like ShopRite are, are giving that food to make sure people that are hungry will have something to eat so that's a good way to give back anybody else any examples out there I and mean, i used to work for target um which was like on the larger end like we talked about Yes. Yeah, Target, um, uh, there's an example in the book that they do give uh, lots of, of, of school supplies, books, other types of things to local school districts uh, to help uh, children in need. So that's what they, that's what they have been known for. And uh, I think they're still doing that, which is great. <laughs> okay, well, let's take a look at a couple of notes here because like I said, this idea of social responsibility has evolved over time. 
Um, most of the time, you know, what everyone thought was businesses need to be profitable, make money, sell their products, uh, employ more people, be more profitable, and the cycle repeats. Um, ben and Jerry's uh, uh, and, and companies like them basically said, no, actually, we really want to do something very different. Um, we, we want to start filling certain needs of society as we make business decisions. Um, Starbucks has decided that a $4 cup of coffee is worth it because they want to make sure that all their employees, even their part-time employees, have some type of health benefits because they understand that's uh, a very important need in society. It's very important for individuals. And so they've decided to sort of make that part of their business decision-making and their social responsibilities to make sure all their employees, even their part-time employees, have some healthcare coverage. Um, but this is, a, this is new. I mean, this has really sort of started up since the, uh, I would say, well, Ben & Jerry's policies were really, in the 80s, were really kind of um, really big in that. And, and you've seen as new companies come to the forefront, Microsoft, uh, Apple, uh, Google, you know, as, uh, as these companies come to the forefront, Facebook, they, they have their own culture and they have their own set of social responsibilities that we're learning about. Amazon has its, you know, you, you see Amazon, if you've ever watched uh, uh, or gotten uh, an Amazon advertisement uh, thrown at you, it's more about they want to have a fleet of vehicles that has zero emissions, right? Because they don't want to, and that's within a 10 year period of time. So they want to basically say, look, we don't, we're a good company because we don't pollute the planet. That's our social responsibility. We, we deliver all these packages. We're very important to people in society and we're giving back by not polluting. So you can't even tell we were here. So these are, these are very important aspects that, that businesses have been talking about for, for some time. Uh, let's to go back a little bit. Uh, there's a couple of things about the historical piece that you need to know. Um, one, for the most part, is something that a lot of people don't know, is that for years and years and years, if you bought something from a business and it didn't work, too bad. <laughs> they call that caveat emptor. It's a Latin phrase that meant let the buyer beware. So if you're buying something from a business and you know they sold you, you know, uh, something that that didn't come out to be true, oh well, you just lost your money on that. That's too bad. Uh, you should understand that prior to the 60s, uh, consumers did not have any rights. So if you bought a product from a business and it didn't work, you had no right to even get your money back. Okay. The company had no legal obligation to even talk to you or explain, oh, well, you, know, you must have broke it. You must have broken it because it was fine when I sold it to you. Um, so what's happened, uh, you know, uh, over, over many, many years, this has been happening for, for some time, like I said, uh, government has decided that the, only, the way to make things better or the way to even the playing field for customers and for employees and for others is to start passing laws to force businesses to be socially responsible. Okay. Uh, it started way, way, way back. Here is a table that shows you from the 1880s uh, to the very, very early parts of the 19, uh, 20th century in 1914, uh, government's very early attempts to say businesses have to do better, okay? So they started with saying, you know, uh, the Sherman Antitrust Act, for example, is prevent monopolies. So, there's, so if you want something, there's more than one seller, okay? Because a monopoly is simply one seller of a product. And if you're the only seller of a product that people need, you can charge them outrageous prices. And so the uh, Antitrust Act was to break up monopolies and to provide for some competition so uh, consumers would have choice and would not get stuck with just one. Uh, they had to regulate food and drugs because again, um, a lot of, and meat inspection was also in the same uh, basic area here. 
because a lot of people were purchasing uh, food and other and medicines and meats that were bad. I mean, you know, when you're when you're buying something and it kills you, that's not a good thing, right? Um, this was happening for some time. Also, the sanitation of of how you handle meat, um, uh, because bacteria forms. You you can kill people uh, with with food based on if it was not prepared well or if some bacteria like E. coli got into the, the food chain. Um, there's a lot of laws that started back in 1906 that started saying, look, you know, you got to make sure things are safe, you know. Um, and so they, they basically started <clears throat> uh, getting involved very, very slowly. Uh, these were very, very early attempts for government to get involved and try to even the playing field. Uh, but it took them a long time to do it. <laughs> uh, we have to understand in our country, we have a very reactive government. In other words, uh, thing, they react after things have been happening for a long time. And so um, slavery was an issue since the beginning of the country, uh, but yet they didn't really, the, the government didn't act. They've been hearing about problems about it for years. They didn't really act until Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, and then that was just to say you can go. They said the phrase to the slaves, "You, you know, you're not, you don't have to be slaves anymore. You can go." But where could they go? Because they had no rights. They couldn't own any property because they were considered property. Um, so you know that wasn't changed, and and that was a problem for a hundred years. 1964, the Civil Rights Act corrected, uh, or was supposed to correct, a lot of the things that happened uh, from the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, to give rights and, and legal recourse to, to uh, peoples who basically had no rights prior to that. Uh, that was 100 years. Uh, unions started in the 1800s. Um, they were illegal, uh, but they that didn't mean it. Sometimes illegal doesn't happen, as you kind of know. Um, you know, so basically speaking, you know, they wanted a 40 hour work week. They wanted a minimum wage. They wanted workers to be safe and uh, on the job. That they complained about that from the 1870s and 1880s all the way through. That didn't happen until the 1930s. So you're going to look at a 60 year period of, you know, people getting overworked and there was child labor and there was no minimum wage and there was unsafe work conditions for 60 years before the government acted. So like I'm saying, we have a reactive government. A lot of stuff has to happen in our society before the government decides to get involved. Uh, that's the country we live in. Okay, it's not a proactive government, it's a reactive government. Um, a lot of stuff has to happen. A lot of bad stuff has to happen before they do anything about it or they get involved in some way. So that's just something you have to know as part of our history of the culture of the country um, and the role of government. So again, uh, for the most part, there were only uh, two views of social responsibility. Uh, one is, like I was saying, the traditional model is businesses have to be profitable. And they're profitable by making products society needs. They sell those products. They, they sell more of them, they employ more people, and that's socially responsible enough. Um, but then again, since Ben and Jerry's time, um, we had this new model, you know, social uh, as well as profitable, you know, looking at the planet, looking at how we treat people, looking at our, are we good citizens in, in, the, in the cities and states that we're located in, et cetera. Um, things have changed quite a bit over time. Of course, your, your book goes over some of the pros and cons. I think you can kind of figure out that there, uh, there certainly uh, are pros and cons to every issue. Um, one thing is because businesses are part of society, um, it, they, businesses cannot really ignore social issues. And so there's a lot of pressure on businesses to act, right? If they see something wrong, um, to act against it. And so you, you, you've been seeing that. You've been, they, they've tried, Starbucks has tried to have uh, uh, discussions on, on racial issues since the country's been 
really having uh, major problems the last several years on those issues. Um, they've tried to say, look, we're part of society, we can't ignore it, so let's be a part of it. Some businesses haven't done anything about it. They just stay away from it. Um, and so it's one of those types of things where it's, it's quite debatable, quite debatable. Um, businesses are also, because they use uh, resources, um, they're also kind of, they need to understand what's sustainable. You know, you can't be using up um, all these resources that are then not sustainable for the future. And so that's something that businesses sort of have to look at. And in order for, be, uh, for it to be sustainable, um, you really have to make sure that there's enough today and there's going to be enough tomorrow for the next generation, et cetera. That's really what sustainability is about. And so are they putting into practice today good business practices that will, for their resources, that will ensure they're using the resources they need now, but there will be plenty of resources in the future for the next generation of you know, society, businesses, et cetera. So uh, there's a lot of issues at stake that fall under social responsibility. Of course, if businesses were, uh, if they did it, if they did act well, uh, there wouldn't be a need for government intervention. But one of the issues uh, still is the role of the government in society. You know, um, the most important part of that <clears throat> is the government makes the laws and the government adjudicates the laws through the judicial system. Um, only the government has a judi judicial system. No other means. There's no private judicial system. Um, only the government can do that, and so that's where it's super, it, very important through the, you know, seeking justice and fairness, and the role of government is really kind of important in that area because no other, no other uh, players in society can do that. Only the government can. Um, of course, one of the uh, biggest problems with social responsibility is that businesses have owners, and the owners are only concerned for their own. I mean, the reason that I'm a, uh, you own a business is because you want the business to be profitable because you're going to be profitable. You're going to be wealthy. So your wealth as an owner your, is the most important thing to you. Not that you're, you know, you're giving away uh, a portion of your products to help people. You know, you don't really give a, uh, a rat's uh, behind about that. What you care about is, hey, as an owner, I want my business to be profitable and I want to be wealthy. And so being socially responsible might get in, might interfere with that. <laughs> might interfere with that. So that's one of the biggest cons is, you know, uh, owners and corporations are owned by stockholders, uh, owners might have a very different view of social responsibility. Some might support it, some might not. Okay. Uh, again, if it's corporate time, if it's corporate money, uh, if it's corporate talent, um, well, the reason that we have that is to maximize our profits, not to solve societal problems. Um, it's a limited view, but it's, 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 it's a very reasonable view, but it's, it's very limited on one. This is just, this is me and my business and that's it without looking at the business as part of society. Okay. And so it's, it is somewhat limited on all of that. Um, one of the issues that bring up uh, that businesses shouldn't be part of socially responsible issues is that social issues are the responsibility of government, not of businesses. And that's one of the uh, arguments that are made on the, on the other side of social responsibility. Okay, so your book goes over a couple of very interesting um, uh, responses to all of this stuff. One is consumerism, you know, are the rights of consumers, that's what consumerism is about, are uh, the rights of consumers being protected um, are, you know, because without consumers, consumers are the people that buy your products, 
offering your services. Without consumers, you don't have a business. And so isn't it right to take care of the people who are your customers? Right? And so consumerism is sort of born out of that. You know, uh, and that's important. Uh, there are uh, issues that fall under the consumer movement that your book talks about. Um, one is that the uh, consumer, your, biz your customers don't want their environment polluted. They want to protect it. Um, and so that's something called environmental protection. Consumers want to make sure that when they're buying products, they're safe. And that if you say they can perform X, they actually perform X. Uh, and so product performance and product safety are extremely important uh, to consumers. And the last part that they talk about here is, you know, uh, consumers have a right to know certain things. And so that's information disclosure. Um, we, have, we have a right to know lots of different stuff. So the basic rights of consumers actually didn't become true until the 1960s. Uh, you might have heard of a president called JFK, John F. Kennedy, uh, who was the last president that's been assassinated. Um, and uh, under the Kennedy administration, early 60s, uh, JFK signed legislation to, to extend the rights of consumers to give them basic rights. What were those rights? Um, the rights to safety, uh, the right to be informed, uh, the right to have a choice, and the right to complain. This is important because a lot of people don't know the right to be heard or complain is really where customer service came into being. Prior to the 60s, no businesses had a customer service center. Or you need to talk with customer service. There was no customer service because they, they didn't give a rat's butt you know, about what you thought. Right was caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. You were unsatisfied, oh well, at least we got your money. Um, but the right to be heard was important because now business, businesses had to respond directly to consumer complaints. They had to sit and talk to consumers. And so customer service was born from this, <laughs> okay? Prior to the 60s, like I said, there was no customer service. And if you work in customer service, you wouldn't even have a job if it weren't for these basic rights that were provided in the 60s from the government to consumers. Um, customer service is all about the consumers having a right to be heard. And if consumers have a legitimate complaint that the business does everything it can to correct it, you, know, you can't be selling people bad products and expect them to be happy with that. It's the business's responsibility to make the product um, new or, or work or function as, uh, as they were gonna sell it. So these are very important strides that happened to American society. Some additional um, rights, including, you know, consumers have a right to be educated, uh, which means being fully informed. Um, and they have a right to expect courtesy, convenience, and responsiveness um, when, uh, when dealing with businesses. Okay. Uh, there are lots of uh, consumerism forces that are out there. You might have heard of adv advocate groups or organizations, uh, educational programs, or other consumer laws. A lot of states have picked up where the federal government left off and made sure businesses know that consumers have rights. So here are some of the legislations, again, starting in the 60s and moving forward. Um, these are some of the rights that uh, have protected consumers to some degree, and your book goes over. Uh, again, federal legislation is legislation out of Washington, DC. So again, making sure that there are warning labels on toxic substances, uh, making sure that there are testing practices for drugs before you can sell the drugs. This is what we're going through, right? We're waiting for a vaccine for COVID. Uh, well, I mean, anybody could have pushed a vaccine for COVID if there was no uh, rules, there were no laws, right? But because there are established laws for testing drugs before you can sell them, we have to wait, right? Because they have to be they have to be safe before they can be used. You know, uh, cigarette labeling, 
Right. Fair, fair labeling on packages in terms of their weight and their ingredients, you know, um, safer cars as is, is, was established in the 60s. Uh, banking, truth and lending, tell the people exactly the full cost of the loan um, because you could, you could hide it. Credit card liability, protect consumers uh, in case there's, there's a fraud, someone steals their credit card and uses credit card, limit the amount the consumer is responsible for. You know, fair billing in credit. Uh, there's a whole bunch that are listed here. You know, nutritional labeling uh, is listed. Um, you know, so there, and of course for children, online privacy and, and so forth, consumer reporting. So, you know, these are all, um, all part of it. Here's the do not call list. This doesn't, doesn't quite work uh, as they expected because uh, a lot of businesses get away, get around that. You can put your number on a do not call list and still get calls, right? Um, credit cards, uh, again, um, sweeping changes to make sure that there's truth in, in credit card lending. So, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's been a lot of legislation aimed at protecting consumers as uh, businesses don't do it. The, the government has chosen to put laws in place to force them to do it. Uh, but of course, it's taken a long time for the government to act, but they've acted. You know, I guess they say better late than never. Um, one of the things that are important too about um, social responsibility is public health, right? So do businesses, or many people believe, businesses need to contribute to the general well-being of, of the public. Well, there's problems with that because of certain things that businesses sell um, to the public that create public health hazards. You probably understand that much of what we eat for food is really not food. Uh, you know, food basically on a, on, a, on a basic level has one ingredient. So chicken is chicken, broccoli is broccoli. Um, you know, uh, lettuce is lettuce, tomatoes are tomatoes. So, you know, th there's one ingredient there, but when you actually buy food from a store, what we often are buying is processed stuff. And part of the process means that they're taking some of the good stuff out and they're adding some other stuff that we don't know what it is. What it is. And we read the ingredients, but we can hardly pronounce some of the words that are part of the ingredient. Um, well, this is the problem with uh, the West. Uh, the, the American uh, food system is not real food. You know, there's a lot of stuff that's food-like products, uh, but not real food. Um, because they add so much stuff in there and they take out some of the good stuff. Uh, that what's left is a food-like product. It might look good, it might taste good, but it has no nutritional value for the body. What it does do is it makes a lot of people obese. Um, and so a big part of the problem that we have today is we have soaring healthcare costs because people are sick. Why are people sick? Well, they're, they, have, they might be obese, they might have diabetes, uh, they might have heart-related issues. Well, how do you think they got all of that stuff? Um, mostly it's from the food they ate, basically. Um, one of the most interesting studies that have been done, if you take a 60-year-old, an average 60-year-old that lives in the United States or Europe, and you take a 60-year-old who, who might be on the plains of Africa or on the farms of Asia, uh, and you looked inside of these 60-year-olds, what you'll notice is because the African and Asian population is still agrarian, they still work on farms, they still live by farming, they don't have heart disease. They don't have obesity because you can't get fat eating wheat or that type of stuff, you know, whatever you're growing. You can't get fat eating vegetables. There are no fat vegetarians out there. 
but if you and 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 vegetables and grains don't ruin your insides they don't they don't have an effect on your heart or your blood vessels but when you look at the west in the united states and europe what you see when you open up a 60 year old is you'll have a lot of of build up of fats and calcium and other stuff in their arteries you'll see that in 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 the uh in the heart showing of pictures of the heart, you'll see calcification of the veins, you'll see obesity, uh, you'll see diabetes, you'll see other types of things because of what we eat, because of what we eat. Sadly, we're stuck with a bunch of companies that would prefer to keep us obese because we like the taste of the food that they put out. Um, and so I would say that for the most part, a lot of the food companies that we deal with are not contributing to the well-being of the public because much of what we eat makes us fat, gives us heart disease, gives us diabetes because it's full of sugar and our body needs sugar, but not that much. Right? So I think what we're looking at is we have a huge public health issue at stake today because much of what we rely on businesses for to provide us food is not real food. It's crap, basically, okay? We're eating crap. And, you know, we're, we're suffering from that. We're suffering from that. Uh, my doctor many years ago gave me some great advice. He just said basically eat food that has one ingredient. Apples are apples. There's no other ingredient. You know, bananas are bananas. There's no other ingredient. Uh, just eat basic um, if you want to stay healthy and stay away from stuff like obesity. Um, smoking, we still, you know, we're still selling cigarettes, even though we know that a lot of the stuff in the cigarettes, um, the chemical process that they're done, the tobacco, the tobacco by itself doesn't cause cancer. But when you process it the way they process it, into a cigarette that causes cancer. Um, you know, we have the vaping. Oh my God, I mean, that, that's going on now, right? That's a product. Uh, does that contribute to the general welfare of the public? It's popular, I understand it's popular. Smoking has been popular for years. You know, that's not unusual in society. What's unusual is it's creating a public health problem, right? Because what do you do when you, uh, what are the problems with smoking? Well, heart disease, cancer, you know, uh, lung problems, etc. Well, that's, who takes care of that? Well, the healthcare system does. So we, we are overloading our healthcare system because we have companies that sell us things that make us sick whether it's the food that we're eating because we're not choosing well, we're choosing taste and not nutrition. Right? We're choosing calories and not the vitamins and minerals that we need in food to live, to, to fuel our, our body cells, right? Our cells need vitamins, minerals, et cetera. But let's have a cookie. Let's have some sugar. Well, they don't need that, but that's what we're choosing because it tastes good. Right. So businesses have us set up. They know we love sugar. They know we love salt. They know we love fat and they're giving it to us in massive quantities. It's, it tastes great and we love buying them, but it's not helping our well-being. And it's making us sick. And when we're sick, we go to the hospital and that's a healthcare problem. So no wonder healthcare is out of control in terms of healthcare costs is we're making ourselves sick with the stuff we eat, with what we smoke, with how much we're drinking. And here, if we are distracted while we're driving, you know, there's nothing wrong with having music in the car. Matter of fact, when radios were first put into the automobiles, which I think you have to go back to the 1940s, 1930s, 1940s for, it was the same complaint. They said, look, you can't put a radio, and of course it was only AM radio back then. Uh, you can't put a radio in a car because they're not gonna be driving straight. They're gonna be listening to the radio. Well, we, we've been hearing these issues for many, many years. We know that there are distractions <laughs> driving. The smartphone is unique because a smartphone is basically a small computer. 
right? You have access to music, you have access to your phone, you have access to the internet, you have access to your email. I mean, it's this computer, basically, in, this, in a very small size. Just a little computer that you can take with you everywhere. That, that does make it distracting. Um, so not only can you, you know, talk and drive, you can actually see the person you're talking to and drive. So if you're looking at the phone, because you're on a FaceTime call, are you looking at the road? Well, that, that can cause a problem, right? So are these companies providing products that provide us with a better life? You know, um, I would say overwhelmingly today, there's a lot of evidence that say no. Um, but it's up to us as consumers to choose better. One of the other issues is there's nothing stopping you from grabbing an apple or a banana. The fact that you grab a muffin or a, or a cookie or, is your choice. Okay, yes, that's true. It's your choice. We have to start thinking about what we're being sold. You know, we have to think about our own health. And then of course, there's wonderful employment practices that have changed over the years. I will tell you, in 1958, my father got his first job for Raytheon. He was there for 44 years. Raytheon's a very large uh, defense manufacturer. They make uh, the sonar, the radar for planes and submarines. And they're, they're a big manufacturer of uh, uh, military and other equipment. And this is how my father got hired in 1958. He just showed up to the door, knocked on the door, said to the foreman, hey, I just... Uh, I'm an electrician, journeyman electrician. I just you know, finished high school and I'm looking for work. The supervisor just looked at him and says, okay, I'll see you Monday. Show up at you know, seven o'clock, we'll be here Monday. That was it. That was it, just show up. And based on how you look, you got the job or not. What if my father was black? What if my father was you know, different? And did the same thing, showed up, knocked on the door, said, hey, I'm a journeyman electrician. I just hired, I just got, I just graduated and I'm looking for work. The supervisor could have easily said, oh, well, we don't have any openings right now. Could have been that simple, yes. And nothing could have been done about it because that's what the employment practices were for many years. So, you look at society, who started businesses, who worked at businesses. Well, it basically it was white men, white men. They're the ones who could own businesses, they're the ones who could work. Um, women didn't get their right to vote until 100 years ago. There was no emancipation equal rights, other types of things for a number of years for many different groups of people based on gender, based on race, based on ethnicity, based on religion. Uh, how, did, how is there any fairness in getting a job? We need a job in our society to make a living. You don't have a job, you don't have an income, you can't pay your bills. So you can't have a place to live, you can't buy food, you know, blah, blah, blah. So having that job is critical in the United States because everything stems from having that particular job. So when employers decide to not hire somebody because of how they look or because of their gender or their skin color is different or their religious or ethnic background is different, that's a problem because we need to have a job to live. Right. So the word minority comes out of this idea of the country was started basically by a bunch of white guys. Right. So, and, and worse, these were white guys with slaves for the most part. And so their wives, if they had wives, they didn't have any rights, they were property. The reason the wife takes the man's last name is to show property. You might not know that. That's where it stems from. The children usually take the man's name because the, they're, they're property too. That's how they were looked at. We all knew slaves were considered property. And if you could own a house or a business, 
You were white and male. Women couldn't do it, even if they were white. The children couldn't do it until they were adults, men, only men. So the country basically in all of the businesses of the country was started by white guys. Okay. So that's how things started. So the reason that, we're, that there's something called a minority group is because of how things start. If all you could be when you started was a white guy and you could either own a business or work for a business, and then all of a sudden a woman showed up, the woman is a minority. All of a sudden, you know, a black or a brown dude showed up, that person's a minority. Why? Because the, the norm for so many years was simply white men working. So you have to understand our history to understand why we consider certain groups minority groups. Thankfully, things have changed and things are changing. Uh, I think for the better. It's, it's rough, but it's moving forward, okay? So you have to look at the idea that anyone who was not white and male had a very difficult time sort of breaking in to the group. Um, and that basically meant that they were not looked upon as equal. So whether you were a woman or whether you were black or brown or Asian, um, you were not looked as equal. And because the country was overwhelmingly white and Protestant, even if you were Catholic, or if you were Jewish, or if you were something else, you might not be looked at as equal. All of that meant that the employment, which was so important to you because you needed a job to live, had all these weird conditions to them. And these conditions were set up by the white guys that set the businesses up and the organizations up. So changing all of that is what we're in the midst of doing. Even today, 2020, we're still changing society because of how it started. Okay. Part of that is to understand the history of the country, how things started. Why things are, issue, are issues today is because of how things started and how difficult it is to change that. So if this happens in the workplace, it's a problem because regardless of what your skin color is, regardless of what your gender is, regardless of what your ethnicity or religion is, you need a job, you need to work, you need to earn a living. And so this is a problem for some folks more than others. Again, it's gotten a lot better over time. We're, thankfully, we're in 2020. And I do look back at our at the history and say things have gotten a hell of a lot better, even though if you watch the television or little snippets of what's going on, you say things are getting worse. No, actually things are getting better. Okay, the fact that we're talking about race means things are getting better because people didn't talk about race when I was growing up. Um, the thing we're talking about equality, that means things are getting better because we never talked about that when I was growing up. So you have to look at this as a progression. It's messy, but it's progress. Okay, so let's get back to this employment. What did the federal government do um, to try to change things? Well, they waited a long time. They waited a long time. It really wasn't until the 1960s and 1970s that the, the government got its act together. Okay, um, there's a couple of charts here that show income levels by race. Um, actually, uh, Asian, uh, Asians make the most. Uh, if you are African American or black, uh, in general, you're, you make the least. Hispanics are next. Whites are uh, closer to, uh, to what Asians make. This is uh, median household income. And that's an important factor because household means everybody in the household. Um, and so Asians tend to have uh, pretty good sized households and they kind of, I married Asians twice. Um, 
they kind of expect everyone to work. So they're, you know, it doesn't, it, it doesn't surprise me that there's higher household income in the Asian category than any other group. But as you see, uh, whites outpace everybody else by a pretty wide margin. Okay. And that's a problem because everybody that has a household needs an income. They have expenses. Right. Uh, when you look at women to men's ratio, 80%, right? This is what men earn on average. That's what women earn on average. So in other words, women are getting about 80 cents on the dollar. Okay. Men earn a dollar, women earn 80 cents um, on the dollar in comparison. Well, government has done a bunch of different things. Um, one is they decided to start a program called Affirmative Action. <clears throat> now it's a specific program for government contracts. The government gives, um, hires companies to do stuff for them. So if they need a, they need a battleship, uh, or they need airplanes or bombs, they're gonna hire a company to make that for them. So they've put basically some extra rules when they do business with companies. So look, all right, you wanna, you wanna make this for us, that's terrific. Um, you have to have affirmative action program on file. So we have to make sure that uh, if you are an Atlanta, Georgia company, where more than half the population is black, uh, that your company is also roughly about half black. Um, and that's basically what affirmative action looks at is uh, if, if, you, if, you know, if I have a factory in, in the Bronx and the Bronx is say uh, a third black, a third Hispanic and a third white, and I walk into that factory, I should see a workforce that looks very similar to the to the Bronx. If I walk into that factory and everybody's white, there's a problem. <clears throat> because it doesn't reflect the community at all. It doesn't reflect the, the fact that it's in the Bronx and the Bronx is quite multicultural. I should walk into a business and also see multicultural. And so affirmative action programs are uh, are somewhat based on on this idea of trying to correct make things fair. Um, and that's, that's basically what their, what their original plan was. Uh, it, it has been plagued um, by a couple of problems uh, that the book mentions. You know, uh, does that mean that you have to have, if you are in the Bronx and you have a company there that have literally 33% of your workforce has to be black because that's what the population is. Um, that's a quota. Uh, there's problems with literal interpretation of that. But in general, the business should reflect the population in the community. Uh, there are some problems with uh, folks that are totally what we call hardcore unemployed. Uh, they have a very, very long history of not having a job. Uh, oftentimes that's related to they might not have much, much education or much job training, and so they don't have a lot of skills to offer. Um, they may have some other issues as well, maybe with alcoholism or drugs or other types of things that contribute to a long history of uh, uh, being what we call hardcore unemployed. Uh, but there are many companies that are involved in helping uh, the hardcore unemployed uh, get jobs, keep jobs, even train them for jobs and your book talks about that. Um, another issue that's very, very important to understand on the job is um, sexual harassment. And that's basically a situation where usually where gender or a gender, an assumed gender role comes into place um, when making a business decision. And so men have always seen themselves as more aggressive in terms of, you know, 
they are the the prowler and they're looking at the prey and women have always been sort of like prey. So I think that there's always been a, a somewhat of an assumed role in society that it's okay for men to say things about women. Um, and that's just the way it is. You know, you're supposed to be whistled at, you're supposed to, you know, have your legs complimented or whatnot and so on. Uh, those roles have, have basically, this is basically very old fashioned type of thinking you need to think about the equal sign. You can't think about the greater than sign or the less than sign. You have to think of the equal sign. And if you are equal, you don't comment sexually or about sexual stuff about other people, uh, particularly at work. Okay, now what you do at, your, at, a, at a club, that's, that might be different. But in the workplace, you don't do that type of stuff. You also don't bully other people. In other words, try to use your power uh, or to be more powerful to, to others by threatening them or humiliating them or intimidating them. Um, these are, are very, very important types of aspects in the workplace. Um, sexual harassment is part of federal law. Um, and states also have their own laws regarding that. Um, your book also mentions that there are some environmental concerns that people have. Um, overwhelmingly, it's, it's about pollution. I mean, just because you're a business and you're producing something society needs does not give you the right to, to you know, dump your waste in the local river. You know? Or if you're a business and you need chemicals to produce what you're producing, doesn't mean you, need, you can dump those chemicals into the ground because our groundwater supply is what we drink, right? So pollution becomes an issue that, look, just because you're a business and you're helping us out doesn't give you the right to start polluting the air or polluting the land or polluting the water. Um, sadly, uh, societies have a, have a history. Once they're industrializing, and this is true across all the, all the world, once a country is industrializing, there's heavy amounts of pollution. Um, but once a country becomes a little bit mature in their economy, in their economic growth, they start cleaning up the pollution. So an example would be, say, China today. China is still in a very, and they have been for the last 30 years, in a very big growth, you know, economic growth. They've been growing, growing, growing. Their economy is bigger and bigger and bigger. And the pollution issue is quite problematic in China for the water, for the air. I mean, everywhere it's just pollution, pollution, and pollution. Uh, the United States was in the exact same place in the 1880s all the way through, even through the 1990s. A lot, we had a lot of growth and there was a lot of pollution of the air and the land and, uh, and the water. And what did the United States do after all? Well, we, we've been cleaning it up. We've been cleaning it up. Um, and we understand that that's, that's a big part of it. So more industrialized countries uh, that have more mature economies, so the developed world, Canada, the United States, Japan, and Europe, a big part of Western Europe, they've, been in, uh, they've gone through that issue where they've been, there's, there's been pollution and now they're cleaning it up. And you have countries like China, Brazil, others where uh, Russia, they're growing, uh, they're trying to grow rapidly in some cases. And pollution is just part of the, part of the process. Uh, eventually, they're going to learn. Of course, they need to clean that up. OK. Um, our government has something called the EPA, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, their, uh, their role is to uh, help enforce the laws to protect the environment. Um, the Trump administration has been rolling back some of those regulations uh, and that's caused a little bit of an issue with environmentalists, um, uh, particularly around oil and gas pipelines, drilling, other things like this. Uh, they're necessary activities, business activities. I mean, we sort of depend on oil, so drilling, and you know, we depend on natural gas, so fracking is, has been part of our business culture for a while. Um, the issue environmentalists have, of course, is that 
your businesses are not doing everything that they can to protect against pollution. And uh, when you have an oil rig that might explode or you have a gas leak and there's oil pouring into the ocean or whatnot, it just points to the fact that there's risks to all types of business activities to the, to the environment. And then your book goes over, you know, some of those environmental laws that have been passed uh, to make sure the water, the air uh, are as clean as possible. Um, and there's a whole list of them in your book that's there. One of the other issues uh, of environmental concern is that we make a lot of stuff that create a lot of trash. And, you know, where do we put our trash? Well, we we dump it in the ground, we dump it in the ocean, I and mean, we just basically pollute the planet with the trash that, we're, that we have. So uh, the idea that recycling can help reduce uh, the amount of uh, waste that we put back into the earth or back into the water and thus reduce pollution uh, has, been, uh, has been an issue. So recycling is one of those types of things. Any type of green power, meaning that we use the sun or the wind or, um, or geothermal power and we don't burn oil, we don't burn gas because that basically adds to pollution, uh, air pollution. Um, these are things that have, we've been talked about for a while in society and it's still one of the issues that we, we struggle with. Companies have gotten on the bandwagon of saying they're green, which means that they're, they care for the environment. Um, you know, here we have Chipotle. Uh, they only use natural animal products. Uh, they're fed uh, a vegetarian diet. They're not, you know, there's no hormones, no antibiotics, uh, et cetera. Um, again, you know, the public wants to have safe options. And so this is just one of those uh, responses that businesses have to it. And your chapter ends with um, some businesses doing something called a social audit. Uh, a social audit basically is uh, a report to measure how a business is doing related to social issues that are important in society. And that, my friends,